Yes. Uh, and we can also do the Facebook Live. So I'll begin. Uh, Anita, ma'am, uh, can I just uh, begin with a yes, short? Of course, of course. Okay, okay. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who has joined us. We welcome the speakers of the panel today, and we also welcome Dr. Anita Shengupta, who is the director of Asian Global Affairs and a member of the Calcutta Research Group. And we will request, ma'am, to please. Uh, take over the session from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Shwadabdi, and a very good evening to all of you. Uh, we have with us a very distinguished panel to talk about uh, the human cost of uh, the new <coughs> transitions in Afghanistan. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Paula Banerjee, uh, Professor Giorgio Dona and Professor Nargis Kanafe. Uh, Professor Banerjee will be beginning the discussion since uh, she has another appointment uh, in a little while. Uh, Professor Banerjee is Professor and Head of Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Calcutta and of course has been both director and a member of the governing body of the Calcutta Research Group for many years. Uh, she's best known for her work on women in borderlands and women and post migration. And uh, she was also former vice chancellor of the Sanskrit University and former president of the International Association for Studies in Post Migration. Uh, since Professor Banerjee will be uh, leaving in a little while, I would request you to put her questions in the chat box as she speaks so that she can respond to them before she leaves or uh, you know, ask her questions immediately after she finishes. Uh, Paula, the over to you to introduce your theme and talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, well, uh, the topic today is on transition and justice in Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan is a country that is on perpetual transition for a very, very long time. Because, you know, if you look at it from the colonial period onwards, interest in Afghanistan have always been there. And, uh, you know, in recent history, and by recent history, I talk, you know, I mean about two, three hundred years history, because uh, we have known that there was interest by the then Russia, United Kingdom, England and the British Empire over Afghanistan. And once that phase was over, somehow in the last 200 years, all the great powers got interested in Afghanistan. But we are not talking about those transitions. We are here particularly to talk about this transition, this particular transition. Now, again, as a historian, I find it very, very difficult to date this transition because often we think of this transition as a 20 year transition or maybe 22 year transition from 1999 onwards. But if you look at Afghanistan's history, you will see that at least it is a 40 year transition because you know what we do not consider is that United States was involved in Afghanistan, not from 1999, notwithstanding Taliban, notwithstanding Al-Qaeda, it was hands-on involved in Afghanistan from 1979 with the Soviet takeover of Afghanistan. They did everything that is possible to stop that Soviet sort of hegemony in Afghanistan. Money was spent. So today, when we hear from the pundits of foreign affairs that US has a debt of two trillion in Afghanistan, probably that money is a lot more. And uh, their uh, interest in Afghanistan is also again, much more deep rooted and much more long standing. So, you know, we have to consider that this was a very long interest in this particular region. From 1999, you know, and, and George Bush, this interest became much more direct. And again, uh, you know, the great war on terrorism was actually fought out in Afghanistan. And um, 
to an extent in Iraq. But, you know, Middle East, as we say, has always been within the sphere of interest of the United States until we heard Joe Biden saying that we should have left long back. But long back meaning when? Because, you know, United States came to Afghanistan, became the occupying force because of uh, Al-Qaeda, supposedly. But, uh, you know, in 2011, with the death of Osama bin Laden, um, you know, United States could have left, but it did not. It stayed for another 10 years. Now, why? Why this interest? And these are the things that need to be really, really looked into. The other thing that probably needs to be looked into is that, you know, what really was achieved as a result of this occupation? Because we hear this, you know, after United States left or whatever, we hear this shrill voice saying, oh my God, everything will be lost. Humanity will lose all that was advanced. But really what was advanced in Afghanistan? I'm not against, uh, you know, this rhetoric, what I'm trying or in, in favor of Taliban for crying out loud, that is not what I'm saying. But, you know, what really was achieved? One knows that in cities like Kabul, things changed quite a bit. It is said that, you know, now this is also, these numbers are also debatable, but it is said that over 35% women in Afghanistan can sign their name. So they have certain rudimentary literacy. Can we attribute it to United States presence? The Americans would say that yes, we should attribute it to the American presence in Afghanistan. And uh, apparently the Americans achieved it by, you know, a, a, and their sacrifice is worth many thousands of people. We know that within the armed forces, and if you look at uh, uh, death of uh, the, the occupying power, death in the occupying power, about 66,000 military personnel died. And, uh, you know, among contractors and civilians, etc., another 5,000 perhaps. But how many Afghans died as a result of this war on terror? You know, by American estimates, it's 120,000, so just the double. And, you know, many more civilians that we do not know about because we only get to know about what is happening in Kabul, what is happening in Kandahar, and probably with few exceptions, maybe here. You know, other than that, we don't know what is really happening. And what we do know is that carpet, carpet bombing was done to control Afghanistan so what Afghanistan lost in terms of infrastructure is probably immeasurable as a result of this war. Again, we think about loss in terms of uh, human rights. We talk about, uh, you know, um, people that have uh, been endangered as a result of this occupation by United States and uh, with Taliban bringing back its, uh, you know, vice and virtue ministry. Um, there is also quite a bit of scare about that. But, you know, um, the thing is, our Taliban, you know, there is very little to sort of, uh, make Taliban palatable in certain ways. Um, but how much of the following was for this occupying power? That is my question. Because United States, as I said, had a presence in Afghanistan for almost 40 years now, not 20 years, 
almost 40 years. And they have been, most of their presence have been destructive in certain ways rather than constructive. Whether you think about destroying Taliban or Al-Qaeda, et cetera, the so-called, I hate this word, but there is no other better word to explain this, and that is the collateral. The collateral for this occupation, the collateral for this support, whichever way you want to spin it, is so huge that, you know, it's immeasurable, as I said. Then, what was achieved? Why did the United States think that they need to spend $2 trillion to be in Afghanistan? What is in their rhetoric achieved? They talk, they talk about, you know, 1 million, 2 million Afghans helping them, trying to leave them, but they leave the country once uh, these forces were withdrawn. But the thing is, did these people get asylum in the United States? No. Did most of them get asylum in Europe and the United States, you know, the occupying forces? No, they did not. You know, for their sacrifice, what do they have to show for it? Another thing one has to remember, and that is, you know, I was listening to Clarissa Ward's report on CNN methodically about women being terribly scared, you know, and, 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 and this whole image of uh, American feminist being the savior of women in Afghanistan. Women in Afghanistan are probably one of the most resilient group of people that I can think of. They have withstood so much, you know, and I come from a culture that has suffered colonialism. So I know how much resilience is needed for a culture to survive. And I think it is a little foolish to say that Afghans or Afghan women just withdrew the moment they saw that Taliban was taking over. No, they were not the type of kind of people who would just withdraw, who would just run and go and buy a new hijab because they wanted to be on the right side of politics at that point of time. That would be doing, arguing in that manner would be doing a disservice to the Afghan women. My contention is, and since this is not the place where I can write a thesis, but to put very concisely what I feel, my contention is whatever the United States and the occupying powers did in Afghanistan, and mind you, they were occupying powers. What they did in Afghanistan was something that only scratched the surface of the problem. They did not try to do, to be really revolutionary. You know, in certain ways, the years before 1999, um, let's say from 79 to about 89, it was way more revolutionary, whether we think of women, whether we think of other human rights issues, whether we think of religion, but, you know, this particular phase, this 20 year phase, it wasn't that revolutionary in its vision. Pretty much what the occupying forces did and what the United States did is that they created a group of compradors. And this group was particularly the elite group, the creme de la creme of society the creme de la creme who were largely urban based people. But Afghanistan is not really an urban based society. So that is why, you know, we were so critical of what was called the lipstick revolution. And a friend of mine did the research and found out that less than 2% of Afghan women even sported lipstick or wanted to sport lipstick. You know, so 
that really was tautology and nothing more. The reason why resistance to Taliban folded so soon was not because of the scare that Americans are leaving, but because, you know, it is very, I think, foolish on our part to think of Afghans as that really, really scared group of people who are so nervous of Taliban. You know, look at the number of Taliban, you know, the number of Talibans who started the occupation. And what did they do? They went to village after village, had conversations with the leaders of that village. And then the village people who were even in the armed forces sort of laid their arms to the Taliban. So it was a dialogic measure. No occupying force is able to do that. No occupying force could have the knowledge of individual villages and the demographic situation of that villages. And so my contention is the Afghans, only a certain group of Afghans who were the beneficiaries, who were the direct beneficiaries of the occupation were, if we, you know, again, a very sort of loaded word, were loyal to the occupying force. This loyalty was again based on, trans it was a transactional loyalty. And the large, the large mass of people who lived in the villages of Afghanistan, who lived in the highlands of Afghanistan, still had their own loyalties to their so-called warlords or to their own group of people. So people in Afghanistan realized that Americans, or for that matter, other occupying forces, the kind of changes that they were trying to make or the changes that they were willing to have just went skin deep. Yes, groups of uh, you know women wanted to have girls' schools were given money. There were people who benefited, but of non women as a group, they did not benefit much. Yes, the gun people who were in the diaspora may have you know, may have wanted or may want to change certain situations, but did the women, how much did the occupying force actually involved in it, what involved in a dialogic process in Afghanistan? The government that they raised in Afghanistan was a palpably corrupt government. We all know about how, you know, the Afghans viewed this government, you know, the general population with hatred and was so much affected by corruption. Actually, in the village, when one hears, um, you know, there was hardly enough food to put on people's table. In 1990, I mean, in 2019, I was able to interview women from around the region of Hirat, from around the region of mazar -e sharif and from around the region of Kandahar, etc., from different villages. None of these women told me, and they were categorical about it, none of them told me that they had they could do anything without the permission of the village elders, that is either the government or as they say the Talib, or the village elders who were all men. So if we think that the occupying force liberated Afghan women, I think that would be a very wrong idea. The other thing is what we do not understand is Afghan women might have a very different notion of liberation. Have they ever thought that whether hijab was a marker of their liberation? It might not be. We have seen 
that many feminists in Tar Turkey argue that the hijab is not a reason for their liberation. There are much more intrinsic, much more sort of uh, symbolic things that they sort of uphold as markers of liberation. So this notion of liberation, again, was a very westernized notion of liberation. And, you know, sometimes people might want their own government, no matter what that government is, that government might not be their ideal, but nobody wants an occupying force. That is at least one lesson that we have learned from history, that nobody remains loyal to an occupying force. So I think it is not correct to think that foreigners could enter Afghanistan, liberate them, and when they stepped out, they were again imprisoned. The Afghans very smartly realized that the occupational force or the occupying force was also creating a prison for them. And probably today's Taliban, I don't know. It's still new, but the way it is going, it might also be imprisoning the Afghan people. I don't know, but jury is still out. But what is certain is that the Afghans did not want the occupying force. No matter what, there might be groups of people who felt endangered because of their relationship to the Western government, to the American government, but even the promises, let alone the promises made to Afghan people, the promises that was made to these people who were directly involved in this process of occupation was not kept. Very few people, if you look at if we are talking of millions, then very few people actually could go to the countries that they supported. There are many more who are in Turkey. There are many more who are around this region. And there are a number of people who are also in India, even though India was not supposed to give asylum, but many people came to India. So. I would suggest that we need to interrogate this notion that suddenly Afghans got scared and brought back their own prison. No, Afghans decided that they did not want to ally, or most of them decided they did not want to ally with an occupying force. And what was advanced was largely advanced in urban areas it did not go deep enough for people to be moved by those changes, to be to people who were convinced by those changes, and definitely not in the rural area, not in the highlands. Taliban always had a control in certain areas which could not be penetrated other than by bombing the spithers out of these regions. So, you know, what was lost and what was gained, at least, according to most Afghans, I think, was that that they lost. It was always a deficit. So, you know, so that is why Afghans accepted Taliban so soon, so easy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Pauladi. Uh, Professor Banerjee talked about the collateral social costs of what she calls uh, 40 years of transition in Afghanistan, uh, with, of course, particular emphasis on what happened um, uh, about uh, women's issues there. Uh, I do not really see any questions in the chat box. So if there are any questions, could you please uh, put on your videos or uh, virtually put up your hands? Uh, because Professor Banerjee needs to leave. So uh, if there are any questions for her, this would be a good time to ask her. Are there any questions? I, I might even try to come back before this ends, the session. Oh, that would be wonderful. That, that would really be wonderful, yeah. Professor Banerjee. Uh, so I think uh, we now move on uh, to Professor Georgia Dona.
uh, professor of uh, post migration and refugee studies and co director of the Center for Migration, Refugees and Belonging uh, in the University of East London. Uh, for more than three decades, uh, she has worked as a researcher, practitioner, and activist with displaced populations and refugees in Central and North America, in East Africa and Europe. Her research focuses on conflict and displacement, child and youth migration, psychosocial perspectives on post-migration refugee voices, and representation and multimodal narratives. Today, she will be focusing her uh, talk on Afghan refugees, transitions, displacements, and protection. Uh, Professor Dona. Thank you very much, Anita, and good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Um, I'm not an expert on Afghanistan per se, but I am an expert in relation to refugees and displacements. And I want to focus my presentation by looking at this um, at transitions through the lens of displacement and refugee movements. So from where I sit, which is at the moment in the UK, during the uh, recent transition of 15 of August, a lot of the media was emphasizing, again, the battle for control of the country that was positioned almost as a clash of civilizations. Then there, were, there was a lot of attention on evacuations, who was evacuated, who could be evacuated quickly. And then we hear, like from, as Paula said, the whole issue of women's rights in the uh, Taliban uh, <clears throat> period uh, and recent transition and what happens next. But like uh, Paula Banjari said, the recent transition is only one in a long history of uh, transitions, occupations and movements um, and displacements. So the purpose of my kind of uh, this, this slide that I'm showing you is to give you an indication of the entanglements of conflicts, displacements and diasporic politics over four decades. But as we know, it is a much longer history of this entanglement, just for us to understand better the, the, the ways in which transitions may um, occur, the displacement they produce. So even if we go back to the most, the last four decades from the, uh, you know, the USSR invasion and the subsequent Soviet Afghan war that lasted for a decade, we, we have the uh, creation of the Mujahideen that were supported by, um, by US forces trying to uh, fight the US backed Afghan army. And that led to a huge amount of uh, people leaving. So we have estimates that almost 2.8 million Afghans fled from uh, the war torn area into the region. And um, uh, they went predominantly to Afghanistan and to, uh, to Iran. And then in subsequent decades, during the previous Taliban's rule, more than 1 million Afghans again fled to Pakistan. When the US invaded Afghanistan, we have more um, movements of um, uh, uh, Taliban forces moving uh, and having trans transnational families moving into other areas of the country and outside the country to um, again create the, the resistance to the US um, um, invaded, uh, to the US occupation. But what is interesting for us to note is that some of the previous um, refugee movements of the 1970s and 1990s areas produced uh, diasporic and refugee diasporas. They were involved in the transformations and previous and, and ongoing transformations of Afghanistan such that when we look at the most kind of uh, symbolically important figures of the last 20 years in politics in Afghanistan, both um, Hamid Karzai, who was the leader of the interim government, entered Afghanistan from uh, Pakistan, having lived as a refugee for many years. And similarly, <clears throat> Ashraf Ghani, the current, the president of Afghanistan until the Taliban took over, uh, moved back to the um, to, to Afghanistan in 2001, having spent many years in the US and having decided not to go back uh, during the USSR invasion, um, having studied in the US. So what we see is that even with the, the recent um, transition and the Taliban gaining power, we have more refugees that are estimated to, to, to flee the country and that will create new diasporic movements and diasporic engagements. So it is important for us to remember the role that um, diasporas and refugees play in transitions in countries <clears throat> that move from one um, form of um, con um, governance to um, control to another. Um, now, 
as we look at all these uh, different refugee movements, I also think that it is important for us to remember that as the, um, again, Western uh, US and NATO-led occupation, uh, you know, took place um, over the last 20 years, on the, it, that we have had a number of um, <clears throat> people moving. And what we see in this slide are the uneven geographies of international protection for um, Afghans. That again point to different uh, power dynamics and the differential architecture of protection globally. So in the context of Afghanistan, with a population that is estimated to be uh, around 40 million, we have um, at present three and a half million people who are displaced inside the country. So I'm now providing evidence to some of the points that Paula was making earlier. So almost 10% of the population uh, are displaced inside the country. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees has registered Afghan refugees across the globe and that they estimate that there are around two and a half million refugees and the majority, like in previous waves of migration, are located in, in the region, in Iran and Pakistan. So we're looking at uh, about 6 million people, which is 15% of the population being displaced inside and across the region. So let us then now reflect on the role of Western countries in providing protection to those who have fled um, and continue to flee. And we can see that the numbers decrease by uh, quite a magnitude. So in terms of asylum seekers that are individuals who come to a country and apply for um, asylum and protection, but they have not been granted protection yet, we can see that Turkey, Germany and Greece top the um, list of asylum seekers with, again, numbers that are in the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands. But then if we look at the US, we can see how those numbers, again, are quite limited. So the US has a resettlement program for 125 refugees um, on a yearly basis, but that is refugees from across the world. And the regional allocation for those from the Near East and Central Asia is 35,000 again, compared to this um, three and a half million or two and a half million. The UK, where I'm located now, has um, um, this, uh, declared, um, has announced a resettlement scheme, scheme um, as a result of this recent transition. And it has committed to taking 5,000 Afghan nationals into 2021 and up to 20,000 in the longer term. So again, we're looking at a few thousand people being resettled in countries that have been quite instrumental in the um, transition of, um, of Afghanistan. But then, um, as again, the media was pointing out that many people were evacuated uh, during the um, recent transitions. And I want to kind of, for us to reflect slightly, not only on the unequal geographies of protection, but also on who are the people who are being um, selected or taken to be resettled in these programs and who are evacuated. And here we have the configuration and reconfiguration of those who are the deserving and undeserving refugees and those who best fit, in a way, the needs of the neoliberal uh, Western um, configuration. So um, according to Reuters, 123,000 civilians were evacuated by the US forces and coalition partners. So again, compared to the millions in the region, these are very small numbers. But what we see is that the ones who have been selected for evacuation are in a way the elite. We can see that they belong to intersecting categories of privilege in order to work for um, you know, the NATO forces, the US forces, they are, uh, these individuals are likely to be educated, mostly to be men, because they needed to move in the regions, mostly urban and um, having intersecting categories of, of privilege. But also what emerges through the evacuations in, in, is another dimension, a dimension through which neoliberalism protection and um, intersect to create those new categories of those who are left behind. And those who are left behind are pretty much the um, individuals who were working for um, the, uh, you know, uh, the US and the NATO forces and the embassies, etc., but in positions of subcontracting, um, in subcontract, in where they were, their roles were subcontracted. So if we look at the, um, one of the estimates that the uh, U.S. Embassy had 2,500 uh, employees who were evacuated. About 2,000 
contractors and immediate family members were left behind. So we're looking at a 50% evacuation and 50, 40%, 45 being left behind. And it is estimated that as many as 300,000 Afghans were affiliated with US operations in the country since 2001. So again, we can see this new kind of categories that are being played out on who is um, allowed to leave the country, who is being um, taken in and who is being left behind. In the UK, again, the numbers are incredibly small, but it's also interesting to see how this new kind of deserving and undeserving kind of categories of refugees are being uh, configured in this recent transition. And I want to focus again on gender and vulnerability and those who are at greater risk. So the UK government is saying that uh, it will give priority to those who are most at risk, to women and girls and religious and other minorities for evacuation. But yet, when we look at the actual, who is actually going to be evacuated according to the criteria of being working for, um, you know, um, the UK government or an embassy or a contracting firm, most of those will be interpreters. And most of them would be men because they were asked to go to um, outside the uh, capital. They would have been, and it would have been very difficult for women to act as interpreters in the rural areas. So most of them would be men. Also, many uh, of the people who were involved in the reconstruction projects, again, predominantly outside uh, Kigali, in the construction of you know, um, buildings and schools, et cetera, et cetera, would have, in the regions, would have also been men. The ones who, the women would have been predominantly those who were activists, uh, journalists, et cetera, and they're mainly um, located in the capital. So we can see here that even though there is a narrative of prioritizing women and girls, the realities of the other strict criteria for evacuation would tend to um, undermine the evacuations and the, uh, of, of women um, into the UK. But then what is happening to in, within this recent evacu evacuation and the, one could say, the global asylum regimes and how they function? What this is creating, it is creating a new way of a, a more general trend, which is a trend of temporariness, permanent temporariness for those who are fleeing countries and precarious lives. We can see that many people have, have, have fled to, into, to the regions where they're likely to live in refugee camps unless they're being supported in, in urban areas by diasporas. Uh, in, but most of them will be in refugee camps or internally displaced in situations of precarity. But even those who are being resettled, the creme de la creme, the elites, are confronted with um, increasing kind of measures that position them in, in, um, in what can be described like a conditional situation of citizenship and protection. So the Afghans arriving in the UK are coming to a, a multiple range of legal statuses through a special immigration visas, humanitarian parole, et cetera, et cetera. Each of them carry different access to benefits and different rights. So we are having this within resettlement countries and resettlement programs, different categories of rights and um, access to um, services. In the European Union, um, although deportations are, are being um, halted, uh, there, has been, there was a discussion um, in, in August about whether deportation of Afghans, which have been taking place over the years, should continue, with six European states at the beginning opposing the suggestion that deportation should be um, you know, stopped, even when the Afghan government was saying that they should be stopped. But even this is conditional on a three month uh, period. So what we can see now is that in this transition, deportations of the Afghans who are already in Europe and are um, on the list to be deported, are only being stopped temporarily, creating, again, new waves of insecurity. And as part of this presentation, I have been speaking to some um, Afghans uh, who are in the UK and also some uh, charities who work in the sector. And the uh, Refugee Council um, and those working with unaccompanied minors have um, told me that you know, most of the, the, the young people that they see would have come through um, the undocumented route. So at present, there are no changes because these children would have not been part of any resettlement scheme anyway. But the, the forecast is that there will be more young people, adolescents, that will be taking the undocumented route because they don't fit within these resettlement schemes um, and, and, and others as well. So we can foresee that there will be more precarity with more waves of undocumented migrants reaching the shores of uh, the Western world. I want to now move on very briefly towards um, 
in a way, the, the last point that is, again, described a lot in the media in addition to as part of this transition, which is the trope of women's rights, um, interventionism and displacement. So we've, we, we know that conversations around, again, uh, the, the, the place and the rights of women in the transition from, from you know, the Western occupied to Taliban occupied um, country um, or um, governing or leading country has been uh, used um, as a way to, uh, uh, to, to explain the reason for intervention. But there is an irony, as Molle was saying, in, in terms of a feminist justification that is being used for, one could say, masculine imperialist uh, tendencies and neoliberal um, goals, um, or what Butler describes as Western impermeability that introduces, going back to Spivak, the idea of the peacemaker masculinity where white men save brown women from brown men. Having said that, the trope of women's rights has been used quite broadly and during the, um, the 20 years of, uh, over the last you know, 20 or 30 years, there are estimates that point to um, increased involvement in, um, of women and greater gender equality. So estimates indicate that the average life expectancy of women has increased by 10 years, maternal death rates are cut in half, that more than 50% girls were attending primary schools and more than 44 young Afghan women were attending universities. And that close to 30% of the uh, members of the parliament were women. So clearly within the country in the last you know, um, 20, 20 years, there's been, women have been at the forefront of um, changes. But again, I, when we look at this within the broader scheme of, um, as, as Paula was pointing out, the intervention, what it has achieved and what it um, uh, lacks behind, we can see that, um, and I want for us to look at the, the table on the left, we can see that most of the trillions of money that have been spent in Afghanistan have actually been spent in military operations, which is the light blue. Um, and only um, a small percentage, which has decreased since 2011 and 12, has been spent on reconstruction. This means that after 20 years of uh, a foreign intervention that aimed to, um, again, um, promote um, democracy, the rights of women, um, you know, and, and, and um, you know, uh, an improved quality of life, we find ourselves in a country where 18 million Afghans out of uh, you know, almost 40 million, which is nearly half of the population, are still in need of humanitarian assistance. And the World Food Program estimates that since the Taliban took, took over, 93% of the population are not getting enough food. But also before the Pali Taliban says control, the number was quite, was very high, 80%. So we have a country that is, um, in terms of the, the suffering of its people, has, is continuing to be, um, uh, to be in a position of high vulnerability. But let us look then um, as a way of coming to an end uh, to this presentation to the, 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 the relationship between women's rights and displacement. When we look at those who are displaced, we can see that women are still very much affected by uh, unequally affected um, in the current situation. Women and children account for 80% of those who are uh, internally displaced. And um, this is also because for women and girls, it is um, not um, likely to be able to cross borders because they don't have passports or even official identifications. And in fact, while 94% um, of men have some form of ID, only 48% of women, according to Refugee International, have an ID card. That means that they are, again, confined within countries of origin, or if they move, they are moving as members of families, like in the evacuations, rather than as principal applicants. But also, as we can see, for those who are resettled, most women don't qualify for these resettlement programs for the reasons I have outlined before, because they're more likely to work in, um, as in subcontractors or subgrantees uh, roles. They are uh, working for community-based organizations in development rather than being interpreters, but also they are more likely to be in, in civilian roles in the government or an activist and human rights defenders, which may not, um, fit within the strict criteria of being evacuated because they have worked for the occupying forces. So to conclude, I hope that in this presentation I have shown you the entanglements of imperialism, neoliberalism, 
with displacements, protection, and humanitarianism that are often kept um, you know, separate in conversations around transitions and uh, refugees. But also, um, I think that in this current transition, what this presentation shows is that the reality of global displacements and the role of refugee diasporas is of paramount relevance to understanding the transition and the justice that Afghanistan is going to um, enter in this new phase. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tona, for focusing on the politics of protection, uh, which determines who actually are what can be called the deserving and the undeserving among the refugees, creating its own uh, politics of precarity in a sense. Uh, uh, thank you very much once again for your presentation. We now move on to Professor uh, Nergis Kanafi, who is Associate Professor with the Department of Politics and Research Faculty with the Center for Refugee Studies at the York University. She is a scholar trained in the fields of political philosophy, post-migration studies and international public law. Uh, she's had years of experience in uh, uh, working with displaced communities and teaching human rights and public law uh, globally. She's also a member of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration. Uh, Professor Kanafi, over to you. Thank you very much. I'd like to share my screen. So I'm trying to do that as we speak. Okay. <clears throat> Can you actually see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, it is visible. Okay. There we go. Right. Uh, thank you very much. And, and my presentation uh, will follow um, both uh, <clears throat> Paula's and, and George's uh, very apt interventions. Uh, especially, we'll um, continue from the point I think George concluded, uh, which is um, global displacement regimes. So. I titled the presentation Afghanistan and its Futures, and I'm going to look into some of the debates concerning transitional justice measures and seeking justice in the long term um, for what is in the literature known as war-torn societies. Um, so let's start with um, mapping out this possession. <clears throat> if you look at um, the way uh, visually the Afghan crisis or the problem has been presented, um, not just in academia, but also in, in global, um, maybe not so much mainstream media, but, but also critical media that's alert to displacements. Um, as you can see the arrows, um, the, the inside arrows are referring to what Professor Donna uh, referred to as internal displacements. And if I'm not mistaken, the figure is, um, one in every time Afghans are actually internally displaced. So there has been like major turmoil for the last 50 years. And then the outside arrows um, are very, very interesting because as you see these arrows out of Afghanistan, uh, the ones that get to this particular country um, head towards Germany, uh, the ones that get into this particular country head to Canada, uh, the ones that get into Yemen head to Jordan and then from there to, it is a multi-stage um, <clears throat> map of displacements. And let's look at another one. And this actually is a very interesting presentation about fluidity of borders because um, <clears throat> Professor Banerjee talked about um, the Taliban um, current regime of containment. And um, these are the border posts that are actually um, <clears throat> controlled by Taliban and, and then the areas in between uh, primarily are open for departure. Um, the last one I'd like to share with you is a very recent map um, that has been partially funded by the Canadian government um, and the Research Council, which looks at um, the frequency of violent events um, in areas where refugees and displaced people arrived and um, and then the title of the project is very interesting. It's Gimme Shelter. Um, I'm not very keen on the title as, as you probably won't be either, but um, when you look at uh, <clears throat> the placement of Afghans in particular, um, it basically goes around here and then all the way to Turkey and then uh, certain um, areas in Iran, um, as well as in Pakistan. So 
um, there are many different ways of reading these mappings of uh, displacements. Now, that's not the topic of my talk, but I just wanted to share these with you in terms of the um, mainstream global understanding of Afghan crisis is all about displacement. It's not about the, what's happening internally, um, which is actually what we're, I think, trying to bring the focus back to. And my talk will also continue along those lines of bringing the focus back into Afghanistan. So as a post-colonial society emerging from protracted conflicts, Afghanistan obviously confronts a very complex legacy of past crimes and um, violence in, in, in multiple forms, uh, starting with the communist rulers, the Soviet occupiers, rural resistance fighters, Islamist parties, Taliban movement, Pakistani volunteers, Al-Qaeda members, warlords, anti-Taliban coalition. All of these parties contributed to the litany of abuses, at least since 1978. And almost no one in the Afghan society has been left untouched, and almost no one with any power actually has clean hands. And many of the civil society organizations within Afghanistan uh, confirm um, that, um, <clears throat> uh, I would say, uh, judgment in, in, a, in a way that this is a, a really, really long-standing uh, conflict within the situation. And so for these very reasons, demobilizing and reintegrating <clears throat> tens of thousands of irregular militia at the moment, as well as creating a new environment and institutional setup are very necessary conditions for any kind of future to be imagined, because at the moment, the focus is on displacement and crisis, and <clears throat> from a, um, a comparative legal point of view, um, I'm looking into the possibility of imagining a different kind of future. And when you look back at the bond negotiation, which negotiations which were almost two de decades ago, um, <clears throat> the post-Taliban succession um, did not raise these issues of past crimes um, in, in an adequate way. But we also know that if they're raised prematurely, um, they may lead fighters to revert to previous modes of societal violence. So perhaps <clears throat> the whole point of my presentation will be um, in terms of scholars, research, and researchers and advocates, uh, the most pertinent point for us to start is truly documenting um, both the kinds and the scales of abuses. And the emphasis should be on the suffering of the victims and the kinds of sufferings that the victims endured rather than the guilt of the perpetrators, which is um, commonly <clears throat> uh, resorted to. In, in complex transitional justice scenarios. Um, and the society has to reconcile with its own history. And that includes um, both what uh, Professor Banerjee referred to in terms of the, the, the internal collaborators, so to speak, to the occupiers, as well as what Professor Donna referred to as um, uh, different parties that are aligned with different powers uh, historically. So, when we look at the kind of images of subjecthood of the Afghan people, um, I don't like sharing images. Um, those of you who know me, I actually draw, um, <clears throat> and, um, and, and there is a certain uh, arterial um, intervention on my part of drawing as opposed to sharing these images. But in this case, it's really, really important. What's being circulated generally is these types of images whereby women are faceless, or you see people in mass looking onto the horizon, waiting for something. In this case, it's an airplane that is to be lifting um, some of the people who are to be taken outside of Afghanistan. Um, so what then emerges in this particular debate of where do you go from here and what kind of direction you follow, <clears throat> we often um, face what's called a numbers game. So several decades of conflict in Afghanistan um, not only led to uh, what Professor Dona rightfully uh, presented as millions and millions of displaced. Currently, it's estimated to be three and a half million, but this is meant to be a very uh, conservative estimate, um, even within the Turkish context. Um, <clears throat> the numbers are cited as 125,000. There were already that many in Turkey prior to the late latest crisis. So these numbers are really, really minimal. Um, but in addition to the displaced, um, there is also lives taken um, and it is estimated to be more than a million 
um, and the country and its people have suffered very grave violations of their rights. And I'm not talking about human rights, but any kinds of rights that you can imagine. And therefore, there's a very strong desire for um, a future orientation towards justice among the Afghanis who remain in the country, um, as well as those who had to depart. Um, but during the time period following the fall of Taliban, as I mentioned, the transitional government <clears throat> with a space uh, of international support actually has ignored the calls to deal with um, the past injustices that, that, that pre precluded their, their, their time in power. And at the moment, it seems to be um, a long call for Taliban to um, resort to um, remedial justice measures concerning what has happened to the Afghan people under their rule. Um, so what happens then is that the fa failure to deal with crimes of the past um, actually threatens the legitimacy and the foundation of um, any of the past as well as new institutions. So in order to move forward to imagine a new future, there's got to be some uh, reestablishment of legitimacy. And the society and the state together uh, have to deal with um, at least select numbers of these past injustices, um, there are certain ways that are suggested um, <clears throat> looking at other examples, um, such as comprehensive national consultations, developing a multi-stage transitional justice strategy uh, with local hybrid courts, uh, if courts are needed, um, if there's an amnesty, then it usually comes with truth and reconciliation, and there are certain institutional reforms to be, uh, to be brought to the core. It has to be coherent, multidimensional, and based on negotiations with different sectors of the public. And, and you might think, what on earth is she talking about? The country is in turmoil. But it's really important to start thinking about these things because otherwise that turmoil becomes a fixated feature of what we imagine the Afghan society and Afghanistan to be. So it's really important to kind of switch the lens towards what are the possibilities. Identification of victims and the ways they've been subject to the mass political violence, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, um, involves a numbers game. And my presentation specifically will talk about who is counted and who does the counting. So the ones who remain in Afghanistan currently will be the subjects, the political subjects who enter negotiations in terms of address of past injustices. And, and, and possible um, transitional justice measures. But the ones who left, um, which is a very sizable diaspora, uh, will most likely be excluded from these negotiations. And as we know from numerous other examples, that often leads to bifurc bifurcations and emergence of diaspora nationalisms, as well as a, a deep-seated sense of injustice for the remaining communities who lost some of their members. Um, we know from the Iraq example, we know from the Cypri Cypriot example, the Syrian example, the Colombian example, those who left, if they are rendered voiceless and if they are not counted, if they're regarded as collateral damage, um, <clears throat> tend to have a way of coming back to the national matrix of identity. So that's one thing that emerged in the Colombian negotiations over and over again. Who do you count as victims? Do you only deal with the ones who survived and who remain inside, or do you also deal with the ones who departed? And that's a very, very big question concerning also um, the context within which people left, uh, because some of them are clearly identified as collaborators. Um, so in that sense, methodologically speaking, <clears throat> I would suggest that we have to pay um, utmost care uh, um, and attention to what we constitute as the Afghan local. And offering a comparative study of transitional justice processes in Afghanistan is no doubt beyond the purview of this particular presentation. However, critically evaluating the way the local is constituted in cost conflict efforts towards reconciliation is, is really, really important. Um, among some of the people at CRG, um, <clears throat> we actually put together a volume that I edited on transitional justice, critical perspectives from the global south. And there, as I argued, there's a tendency in transitional justice efforts to contain the discussion of the local within religious and cultural parameters in the global south, thus engaging only with uh, a static local. 
as interpreted by certain local stakeholders marked by ethnic religious identity. And there's no class, there's no political history, uh, there's no institutional identification. And instead, I would argue in the Afghan case, we really should create a dynamic local where societal norms evolve, realities on the ground are shaped by shifting power dynamics, hierarchies, inequalities be between actors are addressed, as well as histories of statehood are brought to the fore. Um, this is something that Professor Rana Brisamadar actually brought um, to the discussion uh, when myself and, and Paula Banerjee gave a brief talk in Vienna on the Afghan crisis. Indeed, we need to look at who were the key actors <clears throat> in institutional and, and, and statehood terms in the Afghan context so we can inch towards understanding what are the possibilities for the future. And so furthermore, I would argue that the local must be understood as an intersubjective con concept, the meaning of which is not only an evolving and moving target, but also dependent on who is cons consulted to interpret it um, <clears throat> in terms of um, external actors as well as internal actors. And that brings us back to the issue of um, the, the displaced and the dispossessed. So as Professor uh, Dona is, is an expert, um, they have a very, very strong initiative about refugee voices. And I'm going back to these images that I don't like sharing, but needless to say, it's really important. As you can see the gesture, often the refugees and the displaced are either presented en masse. Um, as you can see this, um, there isn't a single sp space for breathing. This is a very recent photograph. Um, this is COVID times. Um, there's a very different understanding of COVID circumstances in the global north, as opposed to these uh, displacement settings. And as you can see here, again, the gaze is towards somewhere else. There's always an expectation. So the refugee subjecthood, uh, for the most part, is presented in, in such a way that you cannot engage uh, with the people present. And, <clears throat> you know, the culprit in these cases might well be the so-called um, so external actors, but I think within the Afghan context as well, uh, the perception of um, the people who are displaced and dispossessed are not that different in the sense that they're not counted as um, members of the community who should sit around the table for negotiating the future of Afghan society. So when you look at the political context um, in Afghanistan dealing with past injustices by developing transitional justice mechanisms may well be the route for the future of the society to hold promise. Um, <clears throat> and often reconciliation is, is promoted as a, a nation building strategy. And in this, in this case, we're not talking about ethnic nationalism, but we're talking about a political community and a sense of belonging. Um, However, there are distinct challenges. Um, first, of, uh, first and foremost, a significant component of such a strategy is based on reconciliation taking place internally among competing armed groups and ethnic identities with the goal of transforming Afghan society. And this assumes the cause of past conflicts to be only internal and along ethnic divisions, which Professor Banerjee already refuted. That's not the case. It's not an internal conflict per se. And when you exclude the external actors, then that limits the accountability for war crimes. Um, this, this presentation also considers violence and war crimes as a thing of the past, ignoring the present situation and ongoing criminal tendencies that are organized. Um, and, and, and last but not the least, given the long history of war between US-led forces and the Taliban, insecurity and escalating levels of violence, um, one has to question whether transitional justice can take place during an ongoing warlike situation. So <clears throat> there needs to be a certain plateau and stability, um, whichever terms those are, um, and from which point onwards you can actually start addressing some of these past crimes, which will hopefully include the fate of the displaced as well. Um, so when we talk about um, <clears throat> histories of human suffering, um, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of um, inch towards a methodological intervention that I'd like to propose. Um, at, through at least the last 30 years of conflict, um, people of Afghanistan have witnessed disappearance, torture, mass executions, um, various degrees of civil conflict, internal displacement, <clears throat> and mass forced uh, migration to Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, and many other countries. 
Um, so almost every Afghan has a story of struggles, struggle, suffering and loss to tell. And in that sense, it's actually, um, at least in terms of uh, the legal framework is very similar to the South African case. You're not going to be able to go after individuals and, 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 and uh, singularly uh, target certain people, but we're talking about um, a, a societal chaos situation. And despite the scale and length of violence, <clears throat> there has been, as I said, no accountability in Afghanistan for past crimes. No concerted effort has been made by the government of Afghanistan, despite the, the, the arrival of uh, Ashraf Ghani from the United States, who is very well educated and very aware of the, con uh, the consequences of, of, of not doing um, um, this kind of, um, um, how shall we say, taking, taking part in the conciliation and, and, and no doubt that there are conditions on the ground uh, that uh, derail such efforts, but it is a must for imagining a future uh, for Afghanistan. And part of this, this effort is considering uh, victims not as sufferers, but also as political subjects with demands and claims. And um, <clears throat> they, I mean, Afghan people never experienced systemic justice for war crimes and crimes against humanity. These have become normalized in their society. And instead, the victims see their former perpetrators uh, in government, in their communities, on television, in positions of power, and this continues to this day. And furthermore, Afghanistan's victims, including the ones who are displaced, largely remain unacknowledged. Um, despite the fact that civil society organizations have been trying to keep a tally. And ignoring victims suffering and grievances will ultimately have very serious long-term consequences and evidence of impunity and lack of faith of uh, injustice um, often act as drivers uh, for repeated insurgencies. And I'm not speaking uh, uh, cold-bloodedly from an international legal law perspective. This is just a well-known fact of war. Um, so when you look at past practices, um, there has been an action plan for peace, um, <clears throat> reconciliation and justice, um, which was dated uh, 2005, and then a law on national reconciliation, public amnesty and national stability, um, which was passed in 2007. What's interesting with that is the amnesty law followed the action plan, and, and therefore the action plan actually failed to safeguard um, against um, the, 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 the blanket amnesty, which is always a problem, because that means there's no lustration, uh, people come back to office, or even the ones who are uh, implicated by mass crimes. Um, and I mean, this is, this is enormous political significance because it sets the stage for further, further reconciliation efforts, that the tendency is towards blanket amnesty. Uh, in which case then you need to look into at least identification of past violences and, and crimes and grievances. And the law prior to the current Taliban regime upheld the right of people to bring charges against individuals <clears throat> who committed political crimes in court. However, the, in the absence of a complaint by a victim, Afghan authorities are prohibited from pros prosecuting accused war criminals. Um, and that normally allows the government to de deflect its responsibility for investigating and prosecuting um, perpetrators of mass crimes. And that's a really, really major wound as far as I'm concerned, if there is, there is going to be any future possibility for the Afghan society. So what do we do? I mean, I, I wear two hats. One is uh, of an international legal scholar. The other is of a forced migration scholar. And <clears throat> I found a little space that's comfortable for me to exist in between those two, um, which is uh, what I call um, ethics of witnessing. And then this is something I've been working on for the last 10 years or so. Um, and I suggest that witnessing is a direct form of ethical and political engagement, uh, which should be regarded um, well beyond this original affiliation with legal evidence and testimonial accounts. As scholars, we each have responsibility to, to document, to witness, to engage. And in situations like Afghanistan, um, rather than uh, proposing solutions, which is not our place in any case, but at least um, in terms of involvement, the documentation, not just numbers and events, 
but also histories of suffering and histories of grievances and histories of claims making is a very important part of witnessing. Witnessing as a methodology has a very long tradition um, <clears throat> among the, the European um, thinkers, but also in postcolonial thinking as well. And uh, witnessing is a political practice of the willful self. Um, if it's undertaken by those who are trained to document, to archive, to preserve, and to advance claims, which we are, um, it binds individual autonomy to institutional structures because universities are power holders and they produce and disseminate knowledge. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and there's a certain cloud that comes from the kinds of things that are witnessed and documented by scholars. And so I, I further venture to suggest that witnessing is a kind of responsibility. And bearing witness is not a solution or a panacea. However, it's a very potent way of engagement with victims, perpetrators, bystanders, benefactors co concerning the reconfiguration of moral and political truth claims. And in the after in case, I think it's really needed for the next 10 to 20 years that people's involvement is not just about charting out who is being displaced, who's being dispossessed, whose voices are heard, but amassing as much as possible so that this conflict is not normalized and neither is the immunity that has been this bestowed upon uh, <clears throat> the, the many layers of um, involved actors in, in the Afghan crisis, including the, the American forces. Um, so witnessing has a unique capacity to question established practices uh, of societal silence and also, it reconceptualizes what testimony stands for. And then that I'd like to uh, link back to the voices of the displaced, because for the futures of Afghanistan, it's really essential that those millions who are no longer there, whether they are calculated as um, <clears throat> um, some, some sort of um, collaborators of the US in man invasion, and I think that's, that's a small portion of them, um, or whether they belong to uh, past um, uh, waves of uh, displacement should be included. And I can see Anita there. So that presumes my time is coming up. So I'm just going to wrap up talking about uh, possibilities. Um, <clears throat> as I said, if we act as witnesses that are trained specifically uh, to collect, document, to analyze, um, as we're dealing with human vulnerabilities, historical injustices, dispossessed populations, marginalized groups, mass political crimes and structural violence, um, it allows us to engage uh, with the, the problem from a critical approach. Um, and it lends a particularly sharp tool for developing an accurate understanding of both the structural causes and the consequences of the phenomena under investigation. So what I'm saying is our work is just beginning in terms of Afghanistan. It hasn't ended. And <clears throat> I have a whole section um, in a new treatise that I'm writing on, which is bringing praxis back to academia. Uh, praxis, as you do know, has a very specific uh, meaning in a Marxist context. Um, so, so it, it basically has a way of engaging with the groups that 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 we work on, um, um, aiming for internal transformation and and possibilities for societal change. And then I've got a whole um, list of suggestions about vocabularies of historical injustice, whether we can actually introduce new terminology uh, dealing with the Afghan problem. And, and, and I think both Professor Banerjee and, and Professor Donna indicated that it is indeed possible um, to, to use, but not only possible, also necessary to use different kinds of terminologies uh, concerning groups affected um, by the Afghan crisis, rather than uh, just using the standard in intersectional language, um, as well as uh, looking at the kinds of uh, movements uh, that affect these populations. Finally, to conclude, the dispossession justice nexus. I think this is really, really important. And international law, these nexus requirements are very essential. Um, so so um, um, I, I really think that it, instead of um, creating nexus requirements for let's say, re refugee recognition, it's really important to create methodological nexus requirements. For instance, if you don't include dispossessed populations in, in your justice negotiations, then likely you're gonna end up with long-term uh, failure of these negotiations or 
a creation of a society which is not at home with its own past um, crimes and violence um, and, 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 and um, is built upon the ashes of other people's um, <clears throat> dead bodies as well as survival suffering. So I think it's also important to develop that kind of language um, which is challenging established legal norms and, 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 and puts dispossession into the framework directly when they're dealing with um, we're dealing with future justice claims. Um, and I think that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kanafe, for talking about transitional justice as a prerequisite for a lasting solution uh, based on reconciliation in Afghanistan. There are, of course, very interesting studies on this, uh, some based on performative arts as a way to deal with this. But I think there will be questions, and uh, I'm very happy to see Professor Banerjee back. So uh, all of us are here, and... Uh, uh, are there any specific questions in the chat box? Uh, uh, let me just check. Um, uh, I think there was a, a comment from uh, Mujib Azizi. And if he would like to continue with uh, the conversation that he has started on the chat box, the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Zizi. Thank you, uh, Ms. Anita, and hi and good evening to all. Uh, just uh, one point of uh, option that I have mentioned by uh, Paula Mann and uh, other colleagues about the Afghan women. Uh, I just would like to one uh, to have one point on uh, Paula Mam and also um, Ms. Kana. Uh, for the women, uh, uh, Paula Mam has mentioned about it, uh, that most of the women in Afghanistan cannot uh, even go for any work uh, without uh, elders' uh, permission. Um, just beside this, that I agree with this, and the situation is even worse than this, uh, because we have uh, uh, conducted a research from 2004 to 2016 by Afghan Research and Evaluation Unit with support of SLRC. Uh, security livelihood, uh, which was mostly village context analyzed in four uh, provinces of Afghanistan. But on that research, we have found this that even if a girl or a woman who would like to start a private business in a city, or he or, or if she would like to get a job in government officials or in any NGOs or even UN organization, she must bring an acceptance letter with a stamp of the Malik of the village that this uh, girl or this woman is qualified and she doesn't have any crime or this or that. Um, even with being of the husband or leadership of the family, this is a must or this was a must even during the Ghani and Karzai government. And this was something that we faced in Herat, Kandahar, Balkh, Nangarhar, and even um, I have faced it in a very bad situation during 2016 in uh, Kandahar that there was a group of vaccinators who were just uh, doing the polio vaccine for the children because of this that the woman at those area are not allowed to bring their children for vaccination to the men or to the male staff. There was a team of women. Unfortunately, in the second day of vaccination, they have been shouted and killed in Kandahar city, right in the city, not even in the local area. When we searched and investigated the reason behind it, it was saying that uh, these people have started their works without permission of their malaks and they didn't have any proper documents. 
This is something that very make you very sad. And coming to the issue of this uh, uh, displacement and uh, talks that uh, that uh, uh, Mescana has talked about, it. one of the most important points for the displacement and uh, how we can say even the people who are who are currently refugee from Afghanistan left forcefully the Afghanistan. These are all these people who left. We have lots of people inside Afghanistan who are trying to get out of the country. If you can see Zabal, Uruzgan, Kandahar, Nangarhar, all these uh, provinces that have border with Pakistan, there is thousands of people, thousands of uh, families who are sitting there in a very bad situation. And when you ask some people, we have sent a team of our staff to uh, uh, Kandahar to ask from Istanbul that border that why people are accepting this because the weather is getting cold and during the night they don't have any place or shelter to live there. They have mentioned that if we stay in Afghanistan, we will be dying during the winter due to lack of uh, place, due to the lack of uh, uh, food and water. And you know, one kilo of gas for cooking, one kilo of gas for cooking is more than, um, it is almost one dollar. It is, even, it is one dollar just uh, uh, for one kilo of gas. And even it is not a good quality. People cannot find, based on the research and based on the esti uh, estimated uh, document that uh, WFP and UN uh, released in 4th of October, 4th of October, almost 97 people, 97 percent of the people in Afghanistan doesn't have job. Those who have their bank account money in the bank, they cannot get their money enough in from the bank. These are lots of crises that we are facing, but um, I don't know how and what will happen to the people. Thank you. For oh, thank you, Mr. Azizi. I think we'll take a set of questions and then get back to the speakers. Uh, there is another question on the chat box, uh, I think, for uh, Professor Kanafe. Um, uh, and maybe she can respond to it. But are there any other questions? Uh, anybody else who would like to ask a question to any of the panelists? We could take them together and then they could respond to it. Uh, the panelists could respond, please. Anita Nestrin has her hand up. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Nestrin. Um, thank you so much uh, for this uh, great panel and a timely one. Um, I might have missed some of them, but um, I'm just curious on, um, like, it's not a question, it's more about, I guess, figuring out uh, the Afghan question. And the Afghan question is something that has been really going on since 79, since the withdrawal of the Soviet. Um, so the war in terror had a different ramification and so on and so forth. So any kind of transition, I'm very curious, how do you define transition? And how do you even define, let's say, transitional justice? Because here's a society that has had the most unjust means thrusted upon them over years. So I think somewhere <clears throat> to disregard the issue of justice is something that it was very painful. Um, that's one. Second, not to address ethnicity in Afghanistan, I find it is very, very problematic. Um, the ethnic identity is a very crucial question. So any kind of democracy and democratization that was trusted upon and which was termed as transition um, attempt, attempted to gloss over this. So how do you address, you know, um, the issue of ethnic identity, which kind of supersedes the so-called consolidated Afghan national identity. Because what you're seeing today is a very different scenario 
Um, but that could have happened or might have had happened that we don't know of when Taliban took over. All right, that was the initial stages when the Taliban came about. Came about. My third point is, uh, I think Nergis talks about, uh, talked about political subject. Um, I don't think Afghans are basically victims. They're survivors. And if it's a question of survival, they were always, they remain very political subjectivity has been something that has been there for years. So how do we even address that? So again, as I said, these are not questions that can be perhaps addressed, but it's something to think about because the subject of Afghanistan is so problematic. And just to truncate it in three different stages and talk about transition, and I think it's, I find it personally very, very problematic. Thank you. Are there any other questions, anybody else? Uh, I not, uh, Professor Shamadar? Yes, madam. Yes, do you have a question for any of the pa yes, panelists? Yes, I thought I had uh, posted a question on the chat box. Yes, yes, we can do, um, you know, we can... Uh, can I add a bit more flesh to that? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, I think I was listening to Georgia's presentation and I, I like the point that she raised, but this indeed then raises the question that how do you frame a refugee policy, let's say in the context of uh, uh, a critical situation as obtains in Afghanistan. And it may happen that in the course of next year, the, uh, you know, the dramatic nature of refugee flows may you know go down uh, and at the and therefore we will have less attention to the refugee problem we shall also have very little attention to the question of idps in afghanistan so what do we mean when we say that we need a coherent refugee policy so this is a question to paula Nargis and uh, Georgia, all of them, if uh, they can throw light on that, or if they think that CRG actually should think much more rigorously on um, can there be a ref coherent refugee policy at all in such a situation of anarchy. But on the other hand, if you say that there cannot be a coherent refugee policy, then we are saying that the refugee policy makes no sense in crisis time. While precisely the crisis produces refugees. So I think there is a bind here and, uh, and we have to discuss. And uh, I think Paula and all three of them uh, raised the question of who are the refugees here? And that also draws our attention to another point and I'm just taking advantage of uh, the uh, scope that you have given me to raise questions, that these are the times when a coherent refugee policy, uh, it is important to think of the problematic. On one hand, we can say that clearly the demand is throw open the borders and allow the Afghans to enter, so that the uh, travesty of humanitarianism that we see here, it can be laid bare. Uh, but on the other hand, the, that who became the refugees? And beginning with Paula, all the panelists have indicated that we have, in fact, very briefly speaking, three kinds of wars uh, going on, or they went on uh, when the so-called Afghan crisis opened up. One is clearly the war between the Afghan nation and the outsiders, the invaders. The second is the war that goes on between various regions, various segments, various communities, etc. Uh, the third is between what is called the civil society and the rest of the Afghans. Because this civil society is an extremely thin layer. Uh, common people were, of course, members of civil society and the 
survived due with the only with the linkages with the regime that the occupation had set up and not everything was against the people so there is a mixed character and the final is there is a gender war also going on so if there is a rebuilding of the nation it is also by making women once again subject to the demands of making a uniform nation and this meeting of these three or four crises then produce the refugees so what does it mean when we say that the crisis requires a coherent refugee policy because the nature of the crisis negates the possibility of having a refugee policy unless we say that yes this is the time when the global community should say throw open the borders to the afghanistan which if you ask me this is what i think should be raised very clearly to the global community Thank you very much. I think we'll get, uh, go back to the panelists and ask them to respond uh, briefly to both the questions in the chat box and the questions that were posed by uh, other participants. Uh, should we go in reverse order and have Professor Kanafe uh, respond first? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So about women's position and um, uh, the, the the question of what will happen, there was a, a question that just arrived a, a second ago on the same issue as well. Um, I, I think it is part of the, the larger debate, um, but also it requires a special kind of attention um, given the burden that Afghan women have carried uh, throughout the multiple stages of conflict as well as when you look at the latest pattern of displacement, uh, mostly uh, men are leaving Afghanistan and women and children are left behind. And that's really, really important to consider in terms of um, future measures uh, concerning their well being and the uh, <clears throat> sustenance of their survival and, and future flourishment. Um, there was a question by um, Zaid Haidari, and that was about. Um, actors who are involved in humanitarian assistance on the ground and whether they have uh, they can have some say about uh, future involvement in justice measures and um, i think historically those two have been separated although we have seen in the syrian case sometimes keeping a tally as to where people left um, <clears throat> the local identities um, their linguistic cultural heritage as well as keeping a tally of their possessions, which is a very important part of that equation, unfortunately, because people don't just leave, um, <clears throat> but they also leave all their entitlements behind, which then gets fed into the emergence of uh, new class structures in the country. Um, displacement all, all often has that residual effect, sometimes that's the intended effect of uh, resorption of people's uh, <clears throat> livelihoods and belongings. So I don't think there has to be a separation, but historically humanitarian aid and humanitarian assistance is, is very present focused. And um, it is uh, um, geared towards immediate solutions as opposed to doing the documenting and witnessing function. So this is something that, that really needs to be discussed, I think, in an ideal world in terms of um, reformulation of um, an Afghan refugee policy, that the, the displaced are not seen as people who will never return, but they are still seen as part of the Afghan society, which is a, a big uh, political question, obviously. Um, in terms of uh, Ranabir's question, larger <clears throat> imperative for at least suggesting an Afghan refugee policy, I would say, why not go for it? I mean, CRG is capable of holding more debates and, and certainly, um, I don't think it should withhold the, the power and the potential of suggesting directives um, concerning the reception, because otherwise it, the, the, the water will uh, follow the same routes through the cracks and, and, and the displaced, especially internally displaced, will never be taken into account and, and other groups will be parcelized or their situation will be normalized. So, so I think it's really important not to wait for the, the, the global think tanks in the North like the Booking Institute and, 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 and many others uh, to come up with their formulas. Um, but but just, just let's just try, why not? 
Um, in terms of Nasreen's intervention, <clears throat> now I'm taking it back a little, maybe I'm misunderstanding some of the terms that are put on the table right now, um, but as we work together for several years, um, I would only hope that the way I use transitional justice is not seen as this kind of, you know, tripartite structure, that's a formula, um, it more amounts to restitutive and restorative measures um, in terms of rebuilding a future society. Um, in terms of, uh, and then I think it really needs to be talked about. I really think that there is place and time for mass atrocities to be addressed, and you cannot move forward imagining a future without these things and not being dealt with whether you name it transitional justice or some other kind of measure of accountability, I don't give it them, to be honest. I'm not so picky about the language, but it has to be dealt with. And as forced migration studies scholars, I think we've been very weak on speaking the truth to justice about this particular issue. In terms of the ethnic groups, I mean, there are 14 of them already counted in the Afghan constitution. So I think Nasrin, you're absolutely right. Uh, and we all know that the Pashtun, Pashtun ethnicity has been the, the foremost one, followed by the, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the Tajiks and the Baluch, uh, in addition to Hazara, Uzbek, Almak, Turkmen, um, Nuristani. Some of these people are recognized and others are not so. And certain ethnic groups have been more adversely affected by displacement. And um, I mean, I think your question in that area falls under the purview of constitutional democracy uh, <clears throat> debates and, and consociational um, arrangements in terms of whether you go to, uh, to a multi-ethnic arrangement as um, <laughs> the American occupiers tried to do in Iraq with an utmost and, and a really, really out outrageous failure. Um, or whether there could be something akin to the, the Indian experiment constitutionally. I'm not so sure. This is something that the Afghan people should decide uh, by themselves. Um, if we are asked our opinions, I think it's really important to think in terms of comparative constitutional politics as to how ethnic groups are attributed uh, regional autonomy and whatnot. And I'm sure there are scholars who deal with regional autonomy. I think there is somebody among us who deals with that right now. Um, but, but in the long run, uh, if we push the ethnic identity to the front, um, it's the Orientalist vision. I mean, it is important, but it's not more important than everything else. And at the end of the day, many of the ethnic groups um, suffered very similar ills. In terms of uh, victims and survivors, I fully agree, these are survivors. But because the issue is accountability, then you do have to talk about the damages that, that have been suffered by the victims, because otherwise you cannot go for removal immune, immunity. Surviving is one thing, and putting emphasis on it is really important for political subjecthood, but for asking accountability, you also have to talk about the things that were done to these people who survived, also the ones who could not survive. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dona? Yes, uh, thank you. So. I think that as a starting point, I like to say that if we think of the suffering of the civilians, we are looking at generations of young people who have born over the last 40 years in a situation of crisis and whose experience has been both inside and outside the country of direct and indirect crisis. So that cannot be uh, underestimated when we think of um, refugees and refugee policies and humanitarianism. I think the purpose of my presentation was mainly for me from where I'm positioned, if I, in terms of, let's say, bearing witness, like, um, you know, uh, Professor Kanefi was saying, it is to look at the, one could say, what I see as, as, as a, an hypocrisy of, of, of the West in spending so much money um, on, uh, over the last 20 years, most of it being spent on um, an army and the combat in a kind of masculine way under the, 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 the guise of, you know, fighting, uh, terrorism when, again, as um, Paula said, you know, um, uh, Osama bin Laden was killed 10 years ago, but and having spent very little on, um, you know, the, the, the improvement of the, of the country, but also for me, the hypocrisy in terms of the global system of refugees, of letting the burden of refugee protection, again, fall onto the, you know, 
onto the shoulders of those that were not necessarily, the countries in the region that were not necessarily part of the occupation of the last 20 years. So in terms of refugee policies, we, the international community has, and we had multiple discussions uh, you know, with colleagues at the Kolkata Research Group and um, in other places, looking at the Global Compact for Refugees, which is the new framework through which the international community is uh, setting up the parameters for the protection and assistance to refugees globally. And we can see uh, that in this case, the case of Afghanistan, again, shows how these uh, international frameworks are still very much embedded into particular vested interest and, and unequal power relations that, again, um, don't necessarily help those who, who need the help uh, mostly. And if I were to identify the, the issue as, uh, and I'm not the only one saying this, is that most of the problems that we, are, we have witnessed in the last you know, 20, 30 years are global problems. So think one can think of economic crisis, one can think of new wars, one can think of refugee movements. The recent pandemic shows that these are international and interdependent global crises. And therefore the solution must be more um, an interdependent one. And I think that what this, the crisis in um, Afghanistan shows is the tension between sovereignty uh, and um, one could say, um, and globalization or um, inter global global vested interests and also neoliberal interests. Um, so in terms of creating a refugee policy, I tend to, I agree that, you know, further discussions um, are warranted. And I think the Kolkata uh, declaration that we developed a few years ago is much more open to incorporating these kinds of crises into, um, into forward thinking uh, around, um, you know, um, displacements um, across the world. Um, and, and just to, to my last point is in relation to, to women. Again, I can comment um, on, on the details on the ground, but again, my, my, my uh, experience looking at gender and displacements and looking at these kind of case studies that if we think of, of the women, they are the ones that are, you know, the, there's been a brain, we also need to acknowledge that as part of this recent process of, it's called an evacuation of displacements, there's been um, as some, um, of you know, participants here pointed out to me, um, um, there's been a, one could say brain drain, but also social cultural drain by the West, by taking, by evacuating those. And I'm not saying that they should not be evacuated because their lives are at risk, but I'm, think, I'm saying that there are broader implications in evacuating the elites, because then the country will be left without a civil society that may be active. But also when we look at these gender dimensions of these evacuations and some of the movements, we can see that the women are the ones who are staying behind. So I'm, you know, I'd like to think that the women will be important social actors in the, this current transition. Thank you very much, Professor Dona. Uh, Professor Banerjee? Yeah, I think we have to rethink the regime of refugees. Uh, protection um, because the thing is you know even now in questions I see questions about how to make it more humanitarian you know that is what we are best at of making everything humanitarian and then forget the whole discourse about rights and justice and for Afghanistan humanitarianism has not worked it will not work probably you know, and, and, and uh, you know, as Georgia talks about it, this is a massive hypocrisy that is going on. And that is why the refugee regime is failing. So, you know, unless we recognize that, you know, it is no longer a question of humanitarianism. And, you know, what is this pathology about whether they're victims or survivors? The thing is, how, how do we help a group of people that we have always discriminated against and marginalized. And also, you know, whether, you know, all of us realize that it is the elite that have been able to evac evacuate. And I have a lot of friends among that group and they have also participated in this. I, I saw their names in this discussion today. But even then, look at, ask them about their situation even when they are evacuated. Because the thing is, 
we do not want to give them justice. You know, who are we to give anybody justice for that matter? The thing is, we cannot even approximate justice, ethics, and rights in this situation. We evacuate people so that we can say that we have helped, we have provided the humanitarian relief. More for our rhetoric than for the people concerned. And, you know, and the thing is, yes, Afghanistan is this classic problem now, this classic situation where we have already begun to think of a diaspora outside. And we are considering about how these people can go back or whether and why if they don't want to go back, what is the reason for that? So, you know, as for gender, yes, there is a gender war going on. It has been going on for over 40 years now. Even under the Soviet regime, there was a gender war and it still continues today. So, you know, if we think that uh, just by occupying a region, we can solve the gender question, it's not a problem, it's a question. Uh, because it is intrinsic to that country's mosaic. And uh, so if we think that we can solve it, then we are being very foolish because the question is indigenous. So the answer has to come from that bedrock, from that mosaic. And uh, we cannot even think of or even approximate those problems now. Of course, there is time. It is time now to rethink the refugee regime. And I'm sure when Professor Shamandar said, should we from Calcutta Research Group continue with this dialogue, he already has the answer. Of course, we will. That's the reason why we started it today. It's not a beginning. We have begun it long back. The platform did it in uh, Vienna and even before. Mujib can sort of talk about that, how Calcutta Research Group has always been concerned about this question, not even interested. We feel a concern and we will go ahead with this. But it has to be thought of globally because this is a global issue. And uh, you know the solution also has to be both local and global. Otherwise, the main question will remain a humanitarian problem and we will not even approximate questions of just. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If there are no other questions, um, I'll just uh, sum up uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, I am by no stretch of imagination either an expert on Afghanistan or refugees, but I was uh, looking into uh, Syrian refugees and um, it was very interesting to see that um, during that time there were new, numerous studies which were referring to the Afghans as uh, no longer being on the priority list of uh, refugees who were, who were being allowed into uh, Europe. So uh, with each stage of transition, uh, the Afghan problem is uh, in a way seen to have been solved, which means that till another crisis evolves, until there are more refugees, uh, one uh, really doesn't talk about it, uh, one really doesn't think about it, uh, which is what brings us, uh, I think, back to the need uh, for a more uh, as Professor Shamada says, a more coherent refugee policy that looks at the question in a more holistic manner. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion and I'm sure uh, Calcutta Research Group will carry it forward uh, in uh, the days to come. Thank you so much. Uh, I hand you over uh, to Shatabdi for the con uh, concluding remarks. Uh, unless Professor Shamada wants to say something because I can see him. No, no, no. Okay. No, I don't even. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So we have the final vote of thanks for the day. On behalf of the Calcutta Research Group, our sincere gratitude goes out to Professor Nargis Kanefe, Professor Georgia Dona, and Professor Paula Banerjee for this insightful discussion. We thank Dr. Anita Sengupto for moderating today's session. We thank our honorary director, Professor Shobhoshachi Bhastu Choudhury, 
and our distinguished chair, Professor Anupi Shamadar, for their guidance. We thank CRG members, members of the webinar committee for all the help and guidance that we've received. We thank our funders, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and IWM Vienna for their constant support. Our sincere gratitude goes out to all our colleagues, staff members at CRG and everyone else without whose help we could not have organized this program. If we, in case we have left out anybody's name, we would like to thank them and we thank all our participants today for joining the webinar. Thank you all of you.